I really want to talk about this coronavirus stuff because this, this is going to be important. And if the coronavirus, first of all, I think it's, it's, it's extremely hard to, to believe that the coronavirus will not have some impact on this country, whether it's domestically, we are, have restrictions on travel or whatever it is, or that we won't have drugs that we need because of shutdowns in production in places like Italy or places like uh, South Korea or places like China. We're going to be impacted in some fashion by coronavirus. And this administration has been vigilant in ignoring any potential um, uh, problems that could arise from this because they don't want to draw attention to the fact that they are woefully, woefully underprepared and that they have cut all, not all, much of the funding that um, for the um, instruments in which we would deal with something like this. Um, they've already pushed back at the, on the CDC for trying to, uh, take over. Um, Schumer was out meeting with, um, apparently, uh, Democrats in the Senate here, according to, uh, I think this acts as what uh, Schumer wants Democrats to push the administration on. He wants the administration to appoint an independent global health czar to coordinate the response. Restore the CDC's budget, which has been cut under the Trump administration. <clears throat> Increase emergency spending for the crisis. Get testing kits for all 50 states. And make sure insurance plans cover the coronavirus. Meanwhile, here's Donald Trump. And he's in India speaking on the coronavirus. If this doesn't give you confidence in this guy, I don't know what will, folks. We're almost in between countries where people weren't going to take them and they're Americans, uh, but uh, they're fully quarantined. They call it fully quarantined. So, you know, we did the right thing. Uh, if you were out there, if you were an American and you refused to have any help from your country, these were wonderful people. It wasn't their fault. So, uh, but we're down to, we're really down to probably 10. Most of the people are outside of danger right now. But we've had a very strict, we've had a very strict line on the people that would take in the areas from which we take. And I did it very early. It's never done before, and I did it early. So I think it was a good decision as it turned out. Yeah. Uh, there he is. He's talking about, now he's saying there's only 10 people. It's down to 10. Now, I don't know what it was down from. We didn't have any before, but the number is actually more than two dozen Americans who have the illness as of uh, when he... Uh, issued those words all the reporting coming out of the white house is that he is really that donald trump is really just concerned with the stock market dropping the stock market has dropped i don't know a couple percentage points over the past couple of days because this is going to impact the worldwide production and supply of a whole host of things like i say ranging from uh, necessary drugs antibiotics and whatnots to things like i don't know uh iphones and more. So, of course, when you are faced with the potential of disruptions and health, you know, dangers to our health in this country from the coronavirus, who do you send out there to calm the fears? Who do you turn to? Who does the nation look to in a moment of possible health crisis? As a so as a sober minded person to to calm our fears. Well, of course, Health minded, certainly Larry Kello. Politico says, Larry, quote, this sounds really, really bad. They quote The New York Times. Americans should brace for the likelihood the coronavirus will spread to communities in the U.S. The CDC warned Tuesday. Dr. Nancy saying it's not so much a question of if this will happen, but a question of when they're warning Americans for significant disruption to their daily lives, Larry. Well, look, our public health people who are spectacular, the best in the world, 
are preparing for any eventualities. And that's exactly what they should do. They were ahead of the curve on the travel bans. Now they're ahead of the curve insofar as laying out potential emergency plans. That doesn't mean it's going to go into effect, but they're doing exactly what we're doing. We're going to get a supplemental. We've asked for supplemental. Pause for one second. Can we just look at the graph they put next to it? It's just like literally dropping as he speaks. No, they, they agree with the travel ban. The travel ban was just a way of discriminating against Muslims. <laughs> what they're doing is what you need to do, or I think you have a cold. And so you they're wash doing your what hands. we're doing. Okay. You do, you have a cold, you wash your hands, you make sure Muslims can't come, you do what you do. Listen, 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 listen. We cut taxes, we get into a pro growth environment, we're going to be fine with Corona. You know what I'm saying? Cut pro growth taxes. environment and look at record African American. Re Reagan, Reagan had yeah. the recipe out potential emergency plans that doesn't mean it's going to go into effect but they're doing exactly what we're doing we're going to get a supplemental we've asked for a supplemental uh, up on the hill of a couple of billion dollars or so that's exactly what they were doing uh, I, I just want to say though as far as the u.s is concerned when you look at this i mean you had a little higher head count on the infections because of the cruise ship people coming off we have contained this we have contained this, I won't say airtight, but pretty close to airtight. We've done a good job in the United States. Hats off to our public health people. Yes, we've, conta we've contained it. We've contained it. It's, it's, cont it's so airtight. <laughs> it's like, it reminds me of like, it's like push. <laughs> you know, I see so that's the airtight seal. I went, psh. It's not anymore. <laughs> now worry, the man. air is out. Just and then it goes pop pop in my tummy. Looks like he's already had the coronavirus. <laughs> yeah, 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 he's looking. I survived. Look, first of all, listen. I've I had Ebola in the 1980s. I had SARS. I had Corona, and I still made money. Or maybe the Budweiser virus. Um, and that's amber liquid. I'm right? actually going to check myself in for the coronavirus myself. <laughs> Best practices. I think I have it. Be back in three weeks. I'll be back in about five weeks because the coronavirus hitting me real bad. Right now, um, <laughs> masks. Masks um, on Amazon are being price gouged. Um, because hospitals are literally going there to fill supply that they can't get yeah. from their normal supply. Line. And what happens too is I'm not in a mask because I have my coronavirus medicine, which is Grey Goose. <laughs> and I can't, I can't get it through the mask. <laughs> It's my medicine. I kills the virus. Uh, take, you gotta douse uh, it. it. Take orally every every thirty minutes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So, so the uh, administration wants to um, has put in a budget for the CDC of something like um, two point five billion dollars for the Trump administration, and uh, Schumer wants eight point five billion because this is uh, going to be a problem, and this is um, and I should say Trump's funding. For that two point five billion takes about a half a bill, a half a um, um, takes a half a billion away from fighting Ebola, right? So maybe, maybe that's not. Uh, you, you, we should be a little bit concerned about it. This is an issue which the Democrats at that debate should have brought up. There was opportunity to talk about it. They talked around a little bit. Um, Matt Stoller has a really interesting piece on his medium uh, medium page, I guess. I don't even know how to talk about that. But um, he quotes John Stokes, who, uh, who uh, looks into sort of these type of sort of like uh, extreme sort of um, uh, situations and uh, saying that it's in all likelihood... <laughs> We will, in all likelihood, be locking down travel in some areas of the U.S. for several weeks, as they did in China. People may be advised against gathering in large groups. It's not clear what any of this will mean for campaigning or primary voting, whether most of us will vote by mail or have our votes delayed. We don't know. Um, and then he goes on to write an interesting piece where he suggests that 
the coronavirus is going to introduce economic conditions with which few people in modern America are familiar. The prospect of shortages. This is highly likely. It's just a question of how widespread it's going to be. He says, after 25 years of offshoring and consolidation, we now rely on overseas production for just about everything. China shut down much of its production. South Korea and Italy will shut down. This coronavirus will reveal, in other words, a crisis of production, one that's coming just in time for the presidential campaign. Now, the thing is, is that final imports, we're not feeling it because it's it's a lagging indicator, right? Stuff works its way through the uh, supply chain, essentially. And then at one point it runs out. Um, he goes on to talk about John Kenneth Galbraith suggesting that we have lived under a political framework known as affluence. As an affluent society, America automatically produces a surfeit of jobs and wealth. The problem is solely one of distributing the bounty. Affluence politics is not the politics of being wealthy, though, but rather the politics of not paying attention to what creates wealth in the first place. He is suggesting here that we're going to go through a period where suddenly we become aware of shortages and that we're going to have to be conscious of like where stuff is coming from. He writes, it's likely Democrats will use this opportunity to further their case for Medicare for all. Pandemic surveillance and medical bureaucracies focused on billing do not mix well. Stories about astronomical out-of-pocket costs for COVID-19 testing are already circulating. Republicans are likely to take a more xenophobic approach, emphasizing restrictions on foreigners and infected Americans. And he goes, when it comes to managing shortages, however, both parties are split. Between the Wall Street factions that assume affluence and the less mature populist factions that seek assertive public power. So the idea is, he says, regardless, the end of affluence politics means focusing on whether medicine is on shelves, not bitter disputes over bloated and wasteful hospital and insurance billing departments. It means caring about bureaucratic competence in government in accuracy in media, not because these are nice things to have, but because they are necessary to avoid immense widespread suffering. It means understanding that pharmaceutical mergers that benefit shareholders while laying off scientists are destructive, not just because they're unfair, but because they make us less resilient to disease. Finally, it means recognizing that wealth, real wealth, is not defined by accounting games on Wall Street, but the ability to meet the needs of our own people someone's going to get to this first and it's either going to be the democrats or the republicans well the republicans already got there we listened to tucker carlson talk about how wokeness is killing people well they're there on the xenophobia part but i'm talking about the part of of an understanding that we need to have production in this country for vital necessities and that there needs to be competence within the context of government. And that Trump could very easily, he would be lying, but this could be the twin, the next phase of his fake uh, uh, populism. We don't make drugs here anymore. It's bad, folks. Yep. And and I just, uh, can I just add just one other uh, sort of, because I love that Stoller piece because it, that's the perfect example of, I think, giving great context of the failures that led to Trump and then how Trump could exacerbate them. And there's a book that I read in college, which I'm sure is somewhat, you know, it's dated because it came out in 2001, but it's been called Portrayal of Trust, The Collapse of Global Public Health by Lori Garrett. And she talks about how starting with Reagan, the United States, which was a pioneer in getting rid of cholera and dealing with tenement outbreaks and all these other like very strong public health efforts have been just gutted. And she traced in, in India in, in the 90s. Uh, like there was a, a, a nomad, I can't pronounce it. There was a plague, basically a controlled plague in India of a disease that was easily treatable with, uh, you know, could have been preventatively treated, but public health was just starved as like a systemic policy because of austerity, basically. So this is another chicken coming home to roost of decades of failed like neoliberalism policy going, as back, a mass killer. Yeah. going well, back to, to, to Reagan, uh, you know, in particular. And, 
that familiar dynamic where the Republicans make the biggest incursions, but the Democrats don't ever actually reverse it. And I remember the most frustrating thing about that book was Bill Clinton had a blurb on it. Of course, came out like right when he was leaving office. Mm -hmm. and he's just, this is really alarming, incredibly important. It's like, oh, well, OK, Bill. Eight years. Also, I read an article in The Atlantic going through the reasons why a lot of companies don't make vaccines because for various reasons, they're costly and tough to make a profit on. Right. That seems like red meat for Bernie Sanders. Right. Well, I mean, at one point, uh, Elizabeth Warren had started off this uh, campaign by talking about making generic drugs. And I think you could do that the same thing with uh, with with vaccinations. Um. So the private sector is not doing well with this. I mean, imagine everyone with asthma all of a sudden having like super cheap, just state provided asthma medication, like how good that would be electorally in the future. Totally. And we know that also that one of the reasons that things, certain diseases do have outbreaks like that migrate from like, you know, uh, you know, uh, poor areas is because there's no business incentive to treat them whatsoever. 